A book was re recently written entitled, When the Cheering Stopped. When the Cheering Stopped. It's the story of Woodrow Wilson. Now, I know that most of you do not remember Woodrow Wilson. He was the president during the 1910s in that area during World War I. You remember that war that was going to end all wars? The war that would bring peace forevermore into our world? Well, Woodrow Wilson was a popular president during the war, and he worked his hardest to make certain that victory was won and that people would find a lasting peace. He struggled for peace. Woodrow Wilson was a popular president unlike several that we've had recently. He was a president that people acclaimed and loved and applauded, and wherever they went, they were so excited to be around him because he had done such a great work. He, he was a popular, popular person. I wouldn't say that he was the Lady Gaga of his day, but he was certainly a well-known individual. And he would travel around the world, and he was actually more popular overseas than he was here. He wanted to get the, late, the League of Nations voted in. Well, the Senate didn't go along with him, and they rejected him. It wasn't long after that that he suffered a stroke. And because of various political wranglings going on within the party, his party lost the next election. In the next few years, Woodrow Wilson was going to die a broken, almost forgotten man when the cheering stopped. We have to be careful in this day and age when we follow people and give our cheer and our allegiance to them because we are so fickle and we can quickly turn our allegiance and the world changes its allegiance so quickly, especially when you're trying to do something that's going to make a difference in people's lives. Jesus was getting ready to come into the city of Jerusalem making preparations and finding the colt that he was going to ride upon and to come into that city as people were going to proclaim him as the Messiah, the Hosanna, the coming king. And they were all excited about it. They were wonderful. They were just there in the, in the multitudes applauding and clapping and singing praises unto Jesus. But yet just a few days, not even years, just a few days, not even a week. Just five days later, these same people were calling for Christ to be crucified on the cross. Why did the cheering stop? Why did the cheering fade away? What happened in the life of Jesus that caused people to change their attitude about this man. Well, first of all, I think it was because Jesus suddenly started more, talking more about commitment. You know, commitment. Putting our hearts and our lives into our faith, putting our actions into work so that we realize that what we're doing is making a difference. And a classic story that Jesus dealt with was the rich young ruler who came to him asking, what must I do? And he said, sell and give to the poor make a commitment to make our world a better place. And that was a message that the people didn't like to hear. I mean, the thousands had followed Jesus to be fed and to be healed, and suddenly Jesus was saying, it's not about you, it's about making a commitment to the kingdom of God. It's about doing what God would have us to do. In fact, if we look at that word Hosanna and what is being said, it really comes from Psalms 118, where the, the psalmist talks about how the people would shout up and say, God save us, God save us, God save us. And so when they were shouting Hosanna that day, they were saying in essence, God save us. And if you look at the political climate of that day and age, you can understand that's exactly what it was about. The people were oppressed, the people were under bondage. The people didn't have the right to rule their own land, and they wanted to be saved. They wanted someone to come and liberate them. God, save us! Hosanna! The difficulty is that we haven't changed. 
we haven't learned our lesson very well, have we? Or if we look at human nature today, if we even look at our own lives, most of what we struggle with is about us. It's not just God save us. Today, the modern refrain would be God save me. Help me, God. Bless me, God. Prosper me, God. Give me a good life, God. Help me, God. Save me. The cheering stopped when Jesus made his call to commitment. The cheering stopped also when people realized that God was opening up the kingdom of God for everyone, not just a few. In Matthew's gospel, it says that Jesus went into the temple and he cleansed the temple, and then he invited all of the poor and all of the sinners and all of those who had need to come in and to be with him. Does that describe the modern church today? I'm afraid it doesn't. But it should. For it's not about us, it's about how we reach out into our community, how we reach out into our world, how we allow people who are different than we are to come and to fellowship and to experience God's great love and grace. It's about realizing that we are all in God's kingdom together. I love the story of the Special Olympics where there were nine children that were going to run the 100-yard dash. And they started out running the race, and about 10 yards into the race, one of the little boys fell down. Well, a little girl had noticed what had happened, and so she stopped and went back and helped him up and put her arm around it. And by the time she had done that, all the other people in the race had come back, and they too had put their arms together, and they all finished the race together. Instead of one winner, there were nine winners. And that's what the kingdom of God is about. It's not about competition. It's not about oppression. It's not about getting our way. It's about bringing in the kingdom of God so the people of God, all of us, can experience His grace and His love. When did cheering stop? When Jesus talks about commitment, when Jesus talks about opening the doors, and when Jesus starts talking about the cross. You see, we have this terrible habit. We want to come to Palm Sunday and enjoy the celebration, and then we want to come back on Easter and we forget all of the trauma and drama in between. And the trauma and the drama of this horrific week is that Jesus is going to struggle with what it means to be the messenger of God and he is going to surrender his life on a cross. And he asked us to do the same thing. Now, we've all been enjoying basketball games for the last few years, it seems like, months, weeks. And uh, I would not call a church meeting for tomorrow night at 8 o'clock in any form or fashion, because I know no one would show up. But the bigger news is that this week, baseball season starts. <laughs> and the story is of a peewee league that uh, they were playing baseball one day, and the coach came up to the little boy and said, sacrifice. You know what sacrifice is? Make an intentional out in order to advance the runner. The little boy was told, sacrifice. Well, the little boy got up, stood up there, and the first pitch came, and he swung with all of his might. Coach looked at him and said, sacrifice. Second pitch came and he swung with all of his might. The coach said, sacrifice. Third pitch came and he again swung. swung? <laughs> I don't have to think about that one. <laughs> he swung with all of his might. The coach came up to him afterwards and said, I thought I told you to sacrifice. And the little boy said, I didn't think you meant it. You know, that's the way we are with God. God wants us to have a commitment in our faith that goes beyond 
just an attendance or just being there when we can or just doing what's convenient. God wants us to have a commitment that goes beyond what the world demands, but what God is looking at us, expecting us to give. And so it is that this week, for those of us who truly follow Christ in our hearts and our lives, we too once more are going to face the cross. We too are going to struggle with what it means to be a dedicated Christian, what it means to be a follower of this one who wants to usher in the kingdom of God. We too are going to come to that time of agony in the garden where perhaps we too can also pray, Lord, not my will, but thy will be done. And if we do, if we do, maybe we as a church, maybe we as a community of faith could rise up and shout, Lord, save them, crucify me. In the name of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.